today we're going to continue as we have been. We started a new sermon series last week. We're continuing with that series, Our Warfare. That is the name of that sermon series, Our Warfare. And we're on the second installation today. And I want you to go ahead and open up your Bibles. We're going to be reading again uh, verses uh, 13 and 14 out of Ephesians chapter 6. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. And today I'm going to be reading it out of New King James. I think last week we read out of New Living Translation. But I'll be watching out of, uh, reading out of New King James Version. And, and we're going to get everybody a chance to open that up. We're going to have it up on the screen for those that are at home as well. I'm going to read this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the church of Christ says, Amen. It says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you, that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore... Hallelujah. Having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to read 14 again. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. May God add blessing unto his holy word. You may be seated in the house of God. You may be situated at home. Get com uh, comfortable and situate your heart to receive the word of the Lord today. And as I said, last week we started the series with our first installment. The first sermon last week, I just always like to do a review every week, was put on the belt of truth. That was the first piece of the armor. We said that Paul was teaching the Ephesians that they needed to put on in order to face these battles, this warfare that we are living or they were living in those days. But today, as we said last week, in this time, in our time, more than ever before, how many know that we are fighting a constant spiritual warfare? How many say amen? We spoke about how the church and the body of Christ must constantly be on alert and in the ready to face the battles whether they're mental, emotional, and even spiritual, that this life is giving and throwing at us and that we have to go through just to live for and as the church of Jesus Christ. The world and Satan, we said last week, wants to deceive us, wants to manipulate us and confuse us and teach us that there are multiple truths we were speaking about last week. But as we know, there is only one absolute truth and that truth is a person and he has a name and he said the truth was Jesus Christ. Amen. And that truth must abide in us, we said, and abide in our lives and bind us to a, con a conduct that, 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 that are of those, as of those that are redeemed by the blood of Christ and live as Jesus being the Lord of our lives. We are a product, we said last week, of the truth that is Jesus Christ. And we are children of the truth. And therefore, we must act accordingly as his church. And in order for us to be victorious in these battles, we said, uh, that lie ahead in our warfare, we must begin to equip and arm ourselves with his holy armor, we said. The armor of God and the first piece was the belt of truth. We explained the foundation behind having the belt of truth first because every other piece of armor is founded in Jesus, in the truth, and in the word of God. How many say amen? And today, we're going to continue with the second piece to our armor, which is the breastplate of righteousness. That is the title of today's sermon. Today's sermon is the breastplate of righteousness. And what does that mean? <laughs> we must almost remember what and whom we are fighting and battling against in our warfare. And just in case we forgot, last week we read this verse. I want to read it again. I want to go back to Ephesians 6, and I'm going to go to verse 12. Paul reminds us what it is we're fighting against. He says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood, he says. We're not fighting these enemies that are made of flesh and blood, but it says, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And since we're not fighting against human enemies, we said, we must properly and spiritually be equipped and armed, and we need to ensure that we put on the whole armor, not just one, not just two pieces 
A lot of people want to conveniently pick what part of armor they want to wear. Well, uh, uh, Pastor, I like the shield of truth or the shield of, of faith, but I don't want to have to wear the belt of truth. But without the belt of truth, none of the other armors all of the pieces of the armor will be able to function properly. Without the breastplate of righteousness, you will not properly be protected, even if you have that shield of faith or, or, or the belt of truth. So you have to be equipped with the entire armor of God. And today, God is reminding us that that breastplate is vital to our spiritual survival. The breastplate is if you remember and you look back to the days of ancient Roman times, this is the model that Paul was using when he was declaring the armor of God. And he was specifying the different pieces of that armor. He was using, since he was a Roman citizen, he was using that Roman soldier as his, his guideline and his model. And that breastplate protected one of the most, in fact, the most vital organs in the body of a soldier. Did you know that? It protected the chest area. It protected the heart. In your chest, what do you have? You have the heart. You have the lungs. In the lower part, you have, you have, you have the liver. You have, you have other aspects and organs of, of the body that are vital to the survival and to the welfare of the soldier. And as born-again Christians, God's divine justice and righteousness must also protect and surround the hearts and the major spiritual organs of the church and Christians from humanistic self-gratification, from religious mentalities and dogmatic traps and workings, and diabolical attacks and influences from our own selfish self-righteousness and egotistical pride. We need to realize and understand that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Jesus is who justifies us and makes us righteous. What is righteous, pastor? I hear that word a lot, righteous. Righteous is making someone right. And we're going to talk more about righteousness and righteous in a few minutes. But, but I want to go into the word of God before I give you a definition. Let's go to the book of Romans. And let's go to chapter 5, verse 1. We understand that through these verses, it declares that Christ is our righteousness. Romans 5, 1, New King James says, therefore, having been justified, another way of saying justified is made righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul once again speaks to the Corinthians in the second epistle of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, New King James, he says the following, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, Jesus. But again, church, we must understand that in order for us to truly be righteous and to truly be victorious and to truly have victory in our spiritual warfare, we have to start with the belt of truth and then we also have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. So I want to do as I did last week. I want to dissect and analyze what the breastplate. Last week, we, we looked at the belt of truth. Today, I want to look at the breastplate of righteousness. My first point is the breastplate from a and in a military context. How did the times, the military times of the day, utilize that breastplate? The breastplate, as we said, was one of the important parts of the ancient Roman armor because it actually protected that chest area. In fact, Breastplate comes from the Greek term thorax, and this term represents the piece of armor that was fitted to the soldier to the chest of the soldier. It was also known as a cuirass, and the cuirass, which is another Greek word, was a custom fit piece of armor. They made it specific to each individual soldier. So, so Oscar, when, 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 in those days, I couldn't use, oh, I forgot my breastplate at home. Oscar, can I borrow yours? I couldn't use yours because yours was made to fit you. I couldn't use Melanie's breastplate because her breastplate wouldn't fit my, my, me and mine wouldn't fit her. So, so in other words, each soldier had a custom 
fit breastplate made to their specific measurements and specifications. That has a powerful message for the church of Christ today. See, see, a lot of people, especially young people, I remember back in the day when I was your age, I was, I was young many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> Some people say that I still look young, but I don't feel it, but that's okay. Praise the Lord. I'm over 50. Praise God. I'm a granddaddy. But back in the day, I used to rely, I used to think, oh, hey, I'm good. As long as I'm under the protection of my parents, my parents are praying for me every day. Why do I have to bother to serve and pray God, pray to God? But, but see, that, this is teaching us that everyone's protection under God is individual. We are to seek to ensure that we are putting on our own custom breastplate. I cannot borrow the breastplate of my parents or the favor and blessing of my parents. Yes, there's a promise upon on our lives for those that pray for their family members and their children but that is limited each individual person one day sooner or later has to come into the realization that they have to make a decision to serve Jesus to give their lives to the Lord and to put on the armor of God and their own breastplate of righteousness how many praise the name of the Lord and that breastplate was specific to each individual soldier. The composition of the breastplate, it consisted of two pieces. It wasn't just the front. It was the front and the back. There were two pieces, one for the chest and one for the back. Because if you only protected the front, if the minute you turned around, your back was vulnerable, they could throw a spear at you or an arrow, and it could go through your back and still get one of your vital organs. So the front and the back were protected. They were made, hallelujah, to the exact measurement of each soldier. And the press plate was adorned, listen to me, to show each breastplate has specific decorations on it and markings to show not only that they were a soldier, but their rank, their status, and their identity, and their authority. Mm. That has a spiritual connotation to it as well. When you wear your spiritual breastplate, you're letting the world know, hallelujah. When you wear your breastplate of righteousness, you're letting the world and Satan and everyone around you know what your identity is. Your true identity is in Jesus Christ. The belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. He is who you belong to. You are fighting for Jesus and against the devil and all of hell. And it gives you the authority. It shows what your status is. Mm. And I'm going to come back to that a little later on. Sometimes you got to let the devil know who he's messing with. Somebody praise him. Somebody, some people think we just got, oh, pastor, I just pray to God. I just speak to God. That's all I have to do. Sometimes you need to speak to the devil. Mm. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying you got to tell the devil. Devil, I'm going to tell you something. I've had enough of you messing with my kids. Uh, I had enough of you messing with my marriage. I had enough of you messing with my health. Uh, I have enough of you messing with my finances. I am putting on the belt of truth. Uh, I am putting on the breastplate of righteousness. And I'm declaring war against you, against your demons, against all of hell. And I'm putting you on notice that come hell or high water, God is going to give me the victory because the battle belongs to him. Uh, and I am his soldier and his child can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord and that brings me to the second point it's gonna be very direct today from a spiritual context point two the breastplate in a spiritual context I want to bring it down break it down a little bit more for you why did Paul use the breastplate as a spiritual representation of righteousness because one thing is to say you have to have the breastplate, but why did he call it the breastplate of righteousness and justice? Righteousness biblically is synonymous with justice and justification. The Greek word for righteousness or justice is, 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 is dikosunis. I'm sorry because I don't speak Greek that fluently. Dikosunis, which implies righteousness of character and quality. It also is a divine attribute that indicates that God is faithful to his nature and his promises. So righteousness is a, a, implies a, a rightness of character and quality. And as far as God's 
nature, he is faithful to that rightness and to his nature and his promises. Look at where Romans 3, 25 and 26 says, and I'm going to read this out of New International Version. I just love the way they worded it here in this version. It says the following, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this, listen, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In Ephesians, it implies here, hallelujah, when we go back to Ephesians in comparison with this verse, it implies that God's just and righteous dealings with sin and with sins is on the basis of Christ himself and his death and the justification process that comes through the sacrifice of Jesus The result of wearing or refusing on the breastplate or putting on the breastplate of righteousness is critical, church. If you decide to reject that blessing and reject the opportunity and the and the entitlement that you have of being able to put on that the access of that breastplate, it speaks of one of two things. It speaks of judgment and condemnation. If we refuse to put on the breastplate of righteousness, because it's an intentional choice to live open and haphazardly and abiding in sin, leaving yourself vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy of the world. Consequently, you're rejecting that divine protection and security of having Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In the case of believers that have put on the breastplate, it speaks of exoneration and forgiveness. Did you know that, church? When you put on the breastplate of righteousness, you are receiving God's exoneration and forgiveness for your past sins. It gives you the ability, and Jesus Christ himself takes the role of judge and of advocate because he says, yes, you are guilty of sin, but because I died and paid the price for you and shed my blood for you and washed you, he presents you now through the blood and the lens of his blood to the heavenly father, and he has reconciled you to give you now a sentence instead of eternity eternal death of eternal life can somebody praise the name of Jesus because we have eternal life in him righteousness and his breastplate secures that protection upon our lives the sacrifice of Jesus Christ satisfies the demands of righteousness of the heavenly father and brought the believer into a righteous relationship with God that's what it does It brings us into a righteous relationship with the Lord. Romans 5, 1 again, it says, Therefore, having been justified, made right by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. He makes us righteous, and therefore God sees us as righteous. Our righteousness and justice is Jesus, church. When God the Father looks at us, As his redeemed children through the blood of Christ, even in the midst of our imperfections, listen to me, we are not 100% perfect, but the Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ sanctifies you day after day after day. How many say amen with me? You have to say it with faith, church, because it's something that you have to believe. I may not feel like it. I may not feel it. We just sang that song, Wavemaker. It says, even when I don't feel you, I know you're working. And some people think that only applies to situations, to circumstances, to problems, to sickness, to lack, to need. But that also applies to your spiritual life. Even though sometimes it doesn't feel like you have God with you and you're a Christian, sometimes you feel physically and mentally and emotionally 
emotionally like God has forgotten about you and I don't even have Jesus next to me. But the Bible, oh, somebody says that the Holy Spirit gives testimony to your spirit that you are a child of God. Is somebody getting the word of God in the house of the Lord? Can you give him a round of applause if you believe that with me, church, today? Can somebody praise the name of God in the house of God? The spirit of God gives testimony to your spirit. It witnesses to you, even though you don't feel like it, Joshua, you are saved. Even though it feels like you don't, you're, you don't deserve it. You know what? The more you feel like you don't deserve it, that confirms that God's grace is in your life. Somebody praise him. The enemy says, oh, you ain't worth it. That's right. Tell him, devil, that's right, I ain't worth it. But that's the love and grace of God in my life. Can somebody praise the name of Jesus? That even though I didn't deserve it, God gives me it with his love. He redeemed me. He restored me. He is healing me. He is perfecting me. Can somebody declare it? Even though you feel like you're sick and your body is falling apart, declare your healing in the name of Jesus. Even though you don't have money in the bank account, declare God's provision over your life. And believe God will give you a blessing and he will make a way where there's no way can somebody believe him and praise him in the house of God with me today even in the midst of our imperfections even though we're surrounded by our mistakes and despite our bad decisions and despite of our continual failures and despite our flaws and misgivings and stumblings into sin he sees in us the righteousness and justification of Jesus Christ through the work of Calvary and the blood of Jesus in our lives through the gifts of the Holy Spirit Jesus manifests his abilities and his nature somebody declare that the nature of Jesus is in me. Say it. Hallelujah. His nature, his essence because of the Holy Spirit is in me. Oh, and it manifests itself through the gifts of the Spirit. Did you know that? Hmm. That's why I love to read Galatians where it talks about the fruit. That's where we see the essence of Jesus, of God manifesting itself in us as well because the gifts manifest his abilities Jesus said to his disciples these things you saw me do these miracles you've seen me perform you will do greater things than me in my name says Jesus but when we talk about God we don't just want to have God's ability and Jesus ability as believers in the church of Christ we should also desire to show and live and manifest God's essence and character and the essence and character of Jesus in our lives and that is done through the fruit of the Spirit. That's the difference between the fruit and the gifts. We got a lot of people praying for the gifts, but very few pray for the fruit. And I challenge you today that as you're putting on the armor of God, church, as you're listening to the rest of this sermon series, say, with every piece of armor I put on, God, I also want you to manifest your fruit in my life. Well, pastor... Well, what are the fruit? What, what is the, I always hear people, what are the fruits? There's not more than one fruit. There's one. <laughs> I've heard people say, oh, the fruits of the spirit in plural. But the Bible says there's only one fruit. The spirit, just like God is one, there's only one fruit. But there are different manifestations of that fruit in our lives. So what is the fruit? Let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 24, and see what Paul says, New King James. It says, but the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. That is the fruit. And that is what is manifest and should be manifest in our lives through the Holy Spirit and through the righteousness of God. See, righteousness through the Holy Spirit reveals and bears witness, as I said, to our own spirit of who we truly are. Look at what Romans 5, excuse me, Romans 8, 16 says, New King James, the spirit himself bears witness 
with our spirit and to our spirit that we are children of God. How many say amen? So if we are children of God, how many are children of their parents? How many are children of their parents? Listen, how many children? Nobody's raising their hand. You're not a child of your parents? Really? Come on. Pastor, you, you, you got me. Yeah, you, some people ain't awake yet. How many are children of their parents? Raise your hand. Everybody. <laughs> Whether they're alive or not, you're children of your parents. Yes or no? Now, if you look at yourself in the mirror and look at your parents, what are you going to see? The resemblance, right? You, you, you may have a mix. I remember when my kids were born. Depends who they like more. If they like my wife more or me more, you would always say, oh, they look just like her. And I knew, okay, they like her better than me. <laughs> Or those that like me more than my wife, oh, they look just exactly like you, Pastor. Oh, they just look exactly like you. You know, that's how, by the way, if your parents or your future parents, that's how you know who likes you better. Your circle of friends, whoever says which kid looks more like you, you know they, they got your back. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's a little nugget for put in your back pocket, save it for later. Praise the Lord. That's another sermon altogether. But anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> but, but we have resemblance right? We have features of our parents collectively. So if we are children of God, who the Bible says that we are children, we are going to have resemblance to our Father and to our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, not only in appearance, not only in what the church sees or the world sees in us, the Bible says that we are to be a reflection and an image of Christ to this world. So when they see you, they don't see you, they see Jesus in you. Can somebody praise the name of the Lord? They should see the love of God when you speak and when you act. They should see the love and feel the grace of God and the mercy of God in how you speak and what you do. When you see someone in need, it it should move you and compel you to want to help out of the love that God has shown to you. You want to partake and give that love to them. How many say amen? And that leads me to my third point and final point. The breastplate of righteousness, and I want to look at it in the context of our warfare. How the breastplate and righteousness play a part in our spiritual warfare. See, Paul uses the breastplate and uses it as a representation of righteousness. First of all, what is righteousness? I said a little bit, righteousness is is doing what's right. But righteousness, if we look at the definition more specifically and more profoundly, it says the following. Righteousness is the quality of being morally right or justifiable. Another definition says acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. Another definition says the quality of being virtuous, honorable, or morally right. But biblically, from a biblical and spiritual context, to be righteous means to obey God's commandments and live in a way that honors God. That is what righteousness is. When we live in righteousness, the breastplate is the vital part of our armor, militarily and spiritually speaking, and we said because As it protected the heart and the core of the soldier's body, the breastplate of righteousness and the righteousness of God should protect the core of our spiritual lives. It should be close to us and surround our hearts uh, to keep us from failing God and from offending God and allowing sin to penetrate in why does Paul associate the breastplate of a soldier with righteousness because just as it protected the soldier from the blows and attacks on his physical body from the enemy righteousness protects the child of God from the attacks uh, to the heart from Satan our spiritual enemy the breastplate also as I said displayed the identity of the soldier by showing his rank so in other words The breastplate showed who the soldier was and what the soldier was. Spiritually, God's breastplate of righteousness shows who we are and what we are in Christ and in God. Who are we, pastor, then? Well, let's look at 1 Peter. The breastplate of righteousness shows 
in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is who you are. And I are. That is what that breastplate of righteousness declares and shows. It shows us who we are. Romans, Paul also says in Romans 8, 16 and 17, that the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. But 17 also says, and if we are children, then we are heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And what are we? What does that breastplate show that we are? Look at what 2 Corinthians says, 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what does it say? He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That is what we are in Christ and what that breastplate shows. We are a new creation. Romans 8, or excuse me, Romans 8.37, yes, says the following. What, all, what also are we, pastor? Well, we're this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. How many say amen? You're more than a conqueror. That's what that breastplate shows. But first, we must be sure to put it on. See, the breastplate set aside does not show that we're more than conquerors. Did you know that? You can't be a more than conqueror if you don't put on the armor of God. Because more than conqueror requires you to suit up and to go into battle. Somebody say amen. Oh, I want the victory. I want to be a conqueror, but I don't need to put on the armor. Well, yeah. You still have to walk into the battle. You still have to go onto the battlefield. You still may have to fight. But no matter what, more than a conqueror means the following. It's not that you don't have to fight. It's that you already won the fight before you start fighting. But you got to fight. How many say amen? I can't win the battle if I don't go into it. How can I? Let me ask you this. If God would have parted the Red Sea and the Israelites and Moses would have stayed on that side of the Red Sea... Would they have gotten into the promised land? Let that marinate for a little bit. <laughs> I got some confused looks. What, Pastor? Listen. Remember when Moses and Israel were going into the promised land? They were being chased by Egypt. They got into the Red Sea. They were right at the shore. They were at the beach. And they had water on one side. They had the soldiers on the other. And on the other side of the water was the promised land. They had to cross it over to get to it. And what happened? There was a miracle. God opened the waters. But if Moses had not made the decision to cross across that sea and get to the other side, they never would have been able to get to the promised land. Yes or no? The same thing with being more than a conqueror. God made a way already. The sea is open. We're more than, we have the victory, but we still got to walk through the sea to get to the other side, to the other side of the victory. How many say amen? So we have to be sure that we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Why? Because without a breastplate, we as soldiers are asking for certain death through any attack. Those, that's why it's just so many Christians that you see that one day they're in church and next day, boom, they're out. Six months go by and they're back in the world again. Because they're trying to fight the battle without putting on the breastplate of righteousness. You cannot win the victory without living for God. You have to have that breastplate of righteousness on because without it, you're asking for death and any little attack of the enemy will mean certain death and become fatal spiritually for you. With the breastplate on and a sturdy breastplate founded in righteousness and the word of God, every time there's an attack that comes against you, it becomes useless, it becomes ineffective and it's like having a bulletproof vest. You ever know that our cops wear bulletproof vests? Why? When they get shot, 
it hits the vest, either it bounces off or it doesn't penetrate and it protects their body. That's what the breastplate of righteousness does when the enemy and the devil and his demons come against you to attack you. That's why the Bible says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Why? Because you have to have the armor and the breastplate of God and of righteousness on you to be able to withstand that the attack of the enemy. Without righteousness, we are vulnerable to spiritual death. But with the breastplate of righteousness, all those attacks will not prosper. <laughs> to live in righteousness is to do what is right in God's eyes. It's to obey his word and his commandments. The opposite of righteousness and putting on that breastplate of righteousness is living in lawlessness and chaos and sin. And it's the opposite of righteousness. Sin brings spiritual and eternal death. Righteousness brings life eternally and abundantly. To live in righteousness is to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And that is obeying God's word of, and his commandments and pleasing and honoring God and being holy because he is holy. How many say amen now? The breastplate empowers us, but it should also Humble us. Listen to me. Because some people like to put that breastplate. Ooh, they, 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 they puff up their chest. Oh, I got the breastplate on. Come on. And it's great to tell the devil, hey, that's right, devil. I'm a God. But sometimes they start using the breastplate against their own brothers and sisters in the church. Somebody. They get that arrogant spirit. Oh, I got my breastplate. Look at my authority. Respect my authority. Because I'm a holy of holy in the church. No. The breastplate should not bring arrogance and pridefulness. The breastplate of God and his righteousness should bring us into a humbleness and a worshiping spirit, understanding that it's by the mercy and grace of God that we have his divine protection and we are called holy and made righteous before the heavenly father. Living in righteousness is not looking down on others that are not saved or others in church that may be struggling spiritually or looking down or tearing down new believers because they are not living living in accordance to what you think they should be living or because they're not as seasoned or as, as, as mature, if you will, in their relationship with God and in the knowledge of the word as you are. Putting on the breastplate and living in righteousness is being humble in the acknowledgement and in the knowledge that is it's only by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, and by the love of God that we ourselves are able to be counted as justified and as as righteous by the mercy of the heavenly father and the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord can somebody say amen it is in that humbleness that we must lift up those that are weaker than us it is in that humbleness that we must lift up those that are struggling or that are in need and spiritually or need to hear God's word we must be images of God's grace and love not just of his authority and his power Church, stand with me in the house of God. We're about to finish. Hallelujah. 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 We praise the name of the Lord. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. In order for us to properly be equipped and be able to properly arm ourselves to have true victory in every battle that we're going to have to face in our warfare. We must first understand that we have to put on the whole entire armor of God. We must understand that although God promised us victory, we're still going to have to fight battles to still be more than conquerors and to walk out in our spiritual guarantee of victory. We must be intentional about putting on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects us. It protects our core and our spiritual body. As Christians, the church of Christ, righteousness, both in thought and in actions, protects our spiritual lives and our hearts. We must apply that, that breastplate to every aspect of our life. And then we can truly live in the knowledge that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. To live in righteousness 
is to do what is right in God's eyes, church. It's not enough to say... And to have faith, we have to live that faith. We have to obey God's word. That is what righteousness is. Obeying and honoring God. Righteousness is not a position of pridefulness or of arrogance, church. Righteousness is a position of humbleness and of grace. Living righteously is not looking down at others. Living righteously is lifting up others. <laughs> but in order for us to be able to put on the breastplate of righteousness, Jesus Christ truly has to be the Lord of our lives. How many say amen? If there's anyone here today that maybe hasn't been putting on that breastplate, then I challenge you. I challenge you to, besides putting on that breast, the, the belt of truth, to also put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put it on. And you will see how you will be protected in spirit. You'll be protected in your hearts. But you will also be pleasing God. You will be seen as righteous and justified before the Heavenly Father. You will be able to declare to the world who you are in Christ. And what you are in Christ. And you will be able to live out in being more than a conqueror. Is there anyone that got a word of God today? If God, if God spoke to you, raise your hand. Raise your hand. God bless you. 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 Hallelujah. If God spoke to you today and he challenges you, then I declare right now that all those that have raised their hand, we are, as of this day forward, are going to make sure that our breastplate of righteousness has been put on. If you got your word and you're online listening, just type in, I got my word. I'm going to put on my breastplate. I'm going to put on that belt of truth and I'm going to put on the whole armor of God and we will see God's victory and blessing upon our lives. How many believe that with me, church? How many believe that? Hallelujah. And if you want to put on the armor of God, the first thing is Jesus has to be the Lord of your life. And if he hasn't been, then I invite you to make him the Lord of your life. Accept him as your Savior and as your Lord. And to do so, we're going to declare this prayer together. I do this every week. I never stop a service or end a service without saying this. We're going to say it together. I'm going to have it up on the screen. And you may already be saved. That's all well and good. But I know that there's someone that you love, someone in your family, maybe a friend, maybe a colleague, whoever it is that may not be saved that you've been speaking to and they haven't made that decision yet, then you're going to pray for them and you're going to pray this prayer on their stead in their place as a prophetic declaration that one day they're going to say this prayer and they're going to be saved and have Jesus as their Lord. So let's all say this together. If you're with me here in church and if you're in watching online, the prayer says the following, Heavenly Father, I come before you and I know that I am a sinner. I truly repent and ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And I accept the sacrifice of your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross of Calvary, where he shed his blood for me to wash me of all my sins. And I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. And I declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my heart and accept him as the savior of my soul. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. And amen and amen. Can we give Jesus Christ a round of applause in the house of God? Because I declare victory. Someone has said that prayer somewhere. And they are now a no born again Christian. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. How many were blessed today? I was blessed. I thank you for those that were here in the sanctuary. I bless those that are also online watching. And we ask you to continue to support us in your prayers and support this ministry. God is growing. God is doing things. This is a new ministry been maybe about a little over a year in the midst of a pandemic and we know we are growing and we're just praying in God's time that he will manifest his glory in this house amen follow us on Facebook guys don't forget follow us on YouTube as well subscribe to our YouTube channel let me bless you how many were blessed amen let us go out in victory let us put on the armor of God and put on the breastplate of righteousness I'm going to bless you so you may be dismissed and we'll see you guys next week, 9 a.m. We're going to have the whole worship ministry with us next week. You won't have to listen to me sing again. Praise the Lord. I pray that you were blessed in the worship anyway. 
These guys do a way better job than I do. So let's pray for them to come back safely. They're all in that convention in upstate New York. So we're going to pray for their blessing and their protection to be back here safe. And let us declare this final blessing so you may be dismissed. Amen. I'm going to bless you all so you can go. You say it. You know it. You can say it with me. Say it loud and proud. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and may the Lord have mercy on you. May the Lord raise his countenance upon you and give you true peace. I now bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and the Church of Christ says, Amen. We love you. We bless you. We will see you next week, 9 a.m. Be blessed, guys. Praise the Lord.